11 seconds remaining. One last rush, perhaps, for the Flyers. Giroux to Hartnell. To Giroux. Giroux holds, holds, all the way across. Parker scores! 2.1 seconds remaining, and the Flyers are on top! Make sure you follow the OMB Puckcast on Twitter at OMB Puck, at OMB Puck, and of course, on any of our several podcast platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Google, SoundCloud, Spotify, iHeart, Stitcher, TuneIn, Deezer, and many, many more, including our own YouTube page. Just look up OMB Puckcast on YouTube, and you'll find us right there. We also have a Facebook page, and if you could be so kind to give us a review on the platform of your choice, or just give us some feedback, appreciate that very much. Enjoy the show. Hey, everybody, it's Isaiah, and I'm here with Chef B, who's going to tell us about one of our sponsors here. Chef? Yeah, OMB Podcast is now brought to you by Summit Public Adjusters. The winter months can be especially hard on our homes, from roof damage to peeling siding to frozen pipes and toilet overflows. Call Summit Public Adjusters before you call your insurance company. Dealing with your insurance company can be stressful and confusing. Let Summit Public Adjusters take the stress out of the claim process by having our guys work for you. Get the most for your money and your repairs. The next time the big snow or the rain leaves you with some home damage, Contact us for a free consultation. Summit Public Adjusters are licensed in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Learn more at summitpublicadjusters.com or call 215-752-0560. Just tell them that the chef sent you. Yeah, what was that number again, chef? 215-752-0560. That's terrific. All right, we're going to carry on with the rest of our show. And hello there. It is Isaiah, and we are back with the OMP podcast episode number 139 as the flyers took us through a 10 game losing streak and have just won two in a row versus the vegas golden knights and the arizona coyotes and we're we're back for the first time since the flyers fired elaine bignot and mike turian and they mike yo the coach and so there's a lot to sort through as we had a little hiatus there. and So let's get rolling. We have a special guest tonight. So our panel tonight, uh, Chef B, how are you, man? Good. Just waiting for some backup to come uh, to this Flyers team and see what we really got, if we got anything. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're going to talk about this team ceiling and what, the, what they look like or going to look like going forward. And, of course, as always with us, uh, the great Dan Silver. I'm doing good, man. I'm doing good. I'm trying to decide if I'm going to keep the paper bag over my head or not. Ooh, yeah, yeah, that's a whole movement, the bag movement. I, Talk about I, that a little bit, a little bit later too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we'll bring it, uh, bring that up for sure. And uh, a first-time guest with us tonight. He's from Flyers Nation. He writes some great articles. He's really on fire lately. Check out his work. He's Dean Chaudry. Dean, how are you, man? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Great to have you along. You've really been knocking it out of the park. So uh, let's get uh, let's get rolling with this. The Flyers have played 26 games or 10, 12, and 4. They won two in a row, like I mentioned. They're a minus 23 plus minus goal differential. So that tells you a lot about it. Uh, they're still 28th in goals, 25th in goals against. It, look, it's been a disappointing season. We fired AV. So, and we have Mike Gill, so we got to talk about that. Uh, before we get to the central thesis of our uh, esteemed uh, guest panelist, Dan, I want you to weigh in because you didn't really have a chance on a podcast. At least I went over to the Flyers Nitty Gritty and had a chance to 
spit out my feelings about the firing of AB, Mike Turian, and uh, the hiring of Mike Yo. So why don't we start there, and then we'll kind of work it around. Yeah, you know, I, the last time we had a podcast, I think I was kind of talking about how pessimistic I was about everything, and I, I was thinking about giving up my, my season tickets and, um, you know, just didn't really feel great about uh, the, the future either in the, the near term or the long term. And since then, they fired Elaine Vigno. It's interesting. I've, I've read some stuff that, that was suggesting that maybe Chuck Fletcher kind of wasn't ready to make that move yet. And uh, Dave Scott from Comcast kind of came in and, and told him after the, the loss to the Lightning, what was it, seven to one, that, hey, you, we can't, you got to fire him. You, you have no other choice. And which is maybe why there really wasn't a backup plan in place in terms of who he's going to bring in as a new head coach and the assistant coaches. So that'll be interesting to kind of see how that develops. But they had to fire Vino. I mean, the, the problem is, is he, even if you want to argue that he's a he's a pretty good NHL head coach, I mean, he's a very successful head coach. I think his record's something like 700 and 500. I mean, he's he's had a very good NHL career, maybe 700 and 400. But um, it just wasn't working here. I, you know, and I don't know, whatever this team went through during COVID, I think there was like no coming back from, I mean, and you know, there were those strange quotes last year where Vino would come out and do things like almost question Carter Hart's work ethic. Um, I, I think that he lost the team at some point and this locker room, you know, there's a lot of debate about whether or not this is a, a group, a leadership group that you can win with. They got rid of a lot of the leadership group in the off season, but um, it, it, it seems like, you know, once a coach kind of loses this group, they don't get them back. And to me, that was kind of where we were with Elaine Vino. It didn't seem like his systems were working with this team. Uh, Michelle Terry and the, certainly the power play system wasn't working with this team. Just nothing was really working. And so I, I think that there were, you know, we could spend hours and hours talking about all the problems that exist uh, within this hockey team and this organization. I think that Elaine Vino was one of the problems. I don't think he's the biggest problem, but I think it was a move that had to be made. And now we'll see how they kind of, you know, react with, with Mike Yo as the head coach. I think there have been some positive signs. But, but yeah, I, I think that Vino had to be fired uh, sooner or later. And I guess it was a little sooner than Chuck Fletcher wanted. But, uh, but yeah, no, I think it was a move that had to be made. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dean, before we get to you, I just want Chef uh, to, to get his chance to weigh in. Uh, yeah, well, I, I like Dan said, it had to be done. Uh, there was no going back. The one thing I was annoyed at, and, and kind of Dan touched on a little bit, was, okay, you know, the power play and other things that were not working. Yet, we didn't, we didn't really do anything to change them or, or fix them. You know, Provi Pro being on the power play. Totally. We've talked about it a couple of times, totally unnecessary, you know? So I, I just want, I just want to, with yo coming in, at least for me, I'm happy with the fact that we're getting different lines. We're getting combinations. We're at least getting experimentation to see whether or not something can work out or possibly work out. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I got a new name nickname for uh, Provi. I, I just call him Probot because he's so robotic out there, especially on the power play. I love his power skating. I love his endurance and, and his conditioning. But, man, his decision-making is his puck handling, and it's, it's, it's frustrating. Dean, we're going to turn over the forum to you, uh, let loose, brother. Well, I mean, yeah, like you guys made very good points. And, like, whenever A.V., felt like he needed to change something. He always made the same change and he always put JVR back on the like top line. He took Yandel off the, off the power play, which made no sense because he was literally brought in for this exact purpose. And then they would never go back to those one timers that every team do, like, you know, uses and actually scores on. And the Flyers just never had, they just looked lost. And the crazy thing is, like, you can't pinpoint the problem with this team like you could in previous years because just everything is is just in shambles. And it's bizarre because, like, it's going to take another four to five years, which we were told during the Hextall era would be four to five years. And now that we're there, it's just going to take more and more time. And it's just frustrating. Yeah, it's, it's just like they're always on a, a permanent temporary retool. 
you yep. know, it's it's kind of like, well, we just need a couple more years for 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 this young player to take a bigger bite of the apple. And then when that guy's up and running. But now I think we're at a decision point with uh, Claude Drew who's going to be 34 next year, last year of his deal. And, you know, there's great potential for them to make big changes. And Dan, I think the big question becomes, it's like, listen, they may make a sneak into the playoffs or do something like that. But I think we all would agree as a fan base, for the most part, we see a clear ceiling on this team and it doesn't scream cup contention by any stretch. So it's like, where are we going with this? Even if they have a little rally and have a nice little season and then get, you know, blown out in the first round. That's what they do every year, right? Like that's what they've been doing for the last 10 years. They either miss the playoffs or they kind of have ups and downs during the season and they they sneak into the playoffs and lose in the first round and something's got to break the cycle. You got to break the cycle and and I think that's why a lot of fans, you know, you see a lot of fans on Twitter almost like rooting for them to lose and some of it's kind of mean natured and but some of it is just the the recognition that the, the only way to break this cycle is if this team is just so bad that they like ha- have to rebuild because otherwise we're just going to keep getting picks in the 8 9 10 11 you know, realm. Uh, obviously, the one time we got a high pick, a couple two times with JVR and Nolan Patrick, they, neither one really worked out all that well. So it's hard to hard to know what to say about that. But yeah, with Claude, the Giroux thing's really interesting because you know, obviously, he has a no movement clause, so he's not going anywhere unless he he lifts that clause. You got to think the guy wants to win a cup somewhere, right? And he's he's got a lot of value. I mean, you'd have to think that you'd be able to get at least a first round pick and, you know, maybe a decent prospect for Giroux. I guess it all comes down to, you know, if what direction they want to go in. And it's, it's, it's a, it's a difficult one. I mean, if, if I would try and move, I would try and move Giroux with the, with the understanding that, that if you do that, he's probably not coming back. And you're kind of going to have to take this team in a different direction. It's with between the salary cap and then you look at the contracts. I mean, you've got Couturier locked up into a long-term deal. You've got Kevin Hayes locked up into a long-term deal. You've got Cam Atkinson locked up into a long-term deal. You've got Ryan Ellis locked up into a long-term deal. There's, it's it's not the worst cap situation in the league. It's also not the best cap situation in the league. And so it, it's that those all those contracts make it difficult to do a quote unquote true rebuild, right? But I, I think I would have to start going down that path and um, and move anything I can that is going to bring back value and might not help me in in the next few years. Which is you know a guy like Giroux, like there's no guarantee he's going to resign here. So you know I, I, he's a guy I would try and move. Travis Sanheim, he probably has a little bit of value. He's got. You know, one year after this one left on his deal, I try to move him. Um, I try to move Travis Konechny. I, I, I'd, I'd do anything I could. We talked about this, you know, in the last show. If I knew that the Flyers were going to be in a scenario, I would have, I would have wanted them to go after Eichel a lot harder than they did because they need that. They need that type of player, and um, they don't have it right now. They don't have it coming up through the system right now. So. It's uh, the crazy thing is, is we've waited so long to get another franchise goalie and it looks like we might have one and we're on track to ruin his prime years. Well, you know, there's a couple points there. I'm going to comment on that. And I'm Dean, I'm going to go to you next. Um, goalies can last a while. He's only what, 23 now. So I'm a little bit more optimistic that, we, you know, you can turn this thing around a little faster, but you know, Dean, this to me speaks to the the problem with what Ron Hextall did. And even hearkening back to your article, uh, June 11th or June 23rd, 2011. See to me, and I could be wrong, but I think for the most part, especially since the lockout, you really need premier talent. And what Hextall did was positioned himself just at the point that he's drafting an average of like 15, except for Provorov and, and, and Patrick Provorov is not as good as we thought he would be. He might get better. Uh, Patrick, we all know what happened there. That was just a, a whiff. 
the Flyers lack that kind of talent. And generally, the only way to get it is if a player like Eichel gets injured, like Dan's talking about, or if they reshuffle the deck, go through the spin cycle of some type of rebuild, like the Rangers did, like to, like like the Maple Leafs did. You come out and say, hey, we're going to have some, quote, pain. It's going to be a little tough for a couple of years. But it, it just doesn't seem to be possible for the Flyers to get that kind of talent and get on a trajectory towards a cup contention unless they do something like that. Well, yeah, like my problem with Hextall was he came in to clean up Homer's mess and he did that through, you know, trades to get rid of the cap. And then he acquired so much, um, you know, future assets, but he never was able to hit any of those out of the park. I mean, he had like eight first round picks in, in, in his five years and maybe four of them were like, good to decent picks. I mean, like you said, Provorov, we don't know what he is because there's, you know, one game where he plays like he's like Victor Hedman. The next game, he plays like he's Andrew McDonald. Konechny, he truly, I believe he has the capabilities to be a good player, but uh, I think Bigneau kind of kept him down. But again, he's making a, a lot of money and he hasn't done much with it. Sanheim, again, inconsistent. So again, like what, what Hextall did was just mind numbing because he never liked to admit it was a rebuild he always said refresh and that he always wanted to contend with the team that that he had and the team that he had sucked like they it it was just Giroux, Jake, Simmons, maybe Shen and then everyone else was just bad and then he took us through four to five years where we were promised of this great chance this promised land where we would have a cup contending team and now here we are and none of his picks panned out. And I mean, you can make the, you know, that Patrick was, you know, all about injuries and all that. But the, the one thing that bothered me the most was hearing that story that his scouts implored him to take Makar or Hask. And it's just like you pay your scouts to watch them play. And again, it, it also reminds me to like Howie, Howie Roseman from the Eagles. Like you pay your scouts to watch these kids play they have all the knowledge and then you go your own route because you just fell in love with a certain player. And again, he, he had that weird love with Patrick because he was from, I think Manitoba played for the like weed Kings. Yeah. And right look, the weekends, yeah. Yeah. And like now look at like where Patrick is and then Makar is like signed to like a long-term deal worth 9.5. He has like 22 points. Uh, Haskin and signed long-term too. So what I would love to see would be the Flyers to just tear it all down, do what Hexel could not do and just get rid of anything and everything that you can and build a- around Farabee, Hart, I guess for now Provorov and I guess Frost. And then it's going to take four or five years for sure, because you can't trade Hayes now. No one, no one's going to want that contract. Atkinson might have some value, but again, he's, he's making close to 6 million. Ellis is making 6 million for another six years. So it's going to be painful, but we need to do what we haven't been able to do in previous years and just tear down every single wall and go through the painful years that can actually bring us something worthwhile. Well, I don't know if it's going to take quite that long, Chef. Uh, The thing is that the cap is going to start going up. If the Flyers can maybe luck out and get a Danny Briere type signing after they kind of clear some space to kind of, turn around the atmosphere like Danny did to kind of make the Flyers a more attractive place. I mean, maybe that'll cut the timeline down a little bit, but maybe I'm just wishing and hoping. What what do you say, Chef? Well, I, I would say that it, it's, it's, we, we thought we were getting a lot of change and we kind of did. And then the injuries changed it almost back to the way it was uh, mediocrity. So, uh, my question would be, and, and I understand that they're probably going to have to tear the sucker down. And, and I said at our last show, too, I'm scared because I don't think Chuck Fletcher is the right guy to do that. And based on, you know, Dean's, you know, articles that he's, he's done, he knows, he know he, he, I think he knows it too. And, and if, if you were, if you were looking out there at this point, I don't know who who would be available and who's uh, to me it looks like a daunting task because you're, you you've got so many pieces to move that are stuck here now and then you got 
you don't have a lot. Like Dan said, there's nothing in the pipeline to get excited about anymore. The problem with Hextall, my biggest problem is I look back now and I go, boy, he got a lot of good picks. They were good. There was nothing stand out really. And if you really break it down, they're kind of almost all the same player. They had medium size, pretty good size. They skated well, and they had great hockey sense. That's probably on every friggin' scouting report for everybody you drafted. You could start right there, and then the little things were different. But so I, I would ask Dean, like, what's your say? I mean, like, do you think that Chuck Fletcher is capable of rebuilding this team? No, nope, not at all. Because like, I think what we saw from him not wanting to fire his own head coach is that I think he's too attached to this current team. Like he's the one who's now built this team. He went out this summer, got all these players because he thought that this would fix that problem, but it hasn't done a thing. And again, I I don't know who is out there to be the GM to fix this mess, but it can't at all be Chuck Fletcher because he's, I think he's only capable of retooling and I don't know how many more retools the Flyers can like actually go through. And what I'm worried about the most is if Scott and Homer want to give him one more shot, because I don't, it just seems like they want to keep him for like one more year. And I don't know what that would entail because I, I know Fletcher is probably grinding gears now thinking of like who to trade and like what to do. And if he trades that first round pick, I would be pretty pissed because that, that can help go a long way to the future and just, yeah, like he, he can't be the one, like no no chance. And and we've seen what he's done in his past, like with Minnesota, he he gutted that team. That team was nothing. And uh, now they're finally able to, you know, be contenders, but that was through a different GM. So I'm not sure who's actually out there to to fix this team, but it better be someone along the lines of Hextel, but someone who's willing to actually gut this team through. Yeah, yeah, Dan, I think, you know, certainly good points here. I think the question becomes, well, it, will Dave Scott let that happen? So, you know, uh, first of all, I don't think Chuck Fletcher is going anywhere anytime soon. I mean, I just, I, it, it seems to me that he's going to be here for a while. I, I'm still not ready to to um, kind of uh, be quite as, as negative and poss- pessimistic about Chuck Fletcher's ability to maybe do a rebuild as, as, as Dean is. You know, I... In Minnesota, one thing he did was he drafted a franchise player there in the fifth or sixth round. I mean, he, he drafted Kirill Kaprizov. I know that it was a different time, a different era when, you know, they, some of the Russian guys lasted longer because there were questions about wh- when or if they were going to come over. But he does have that on his resume. Um, and also, you know, I, I still am fairly impressed with what Chuck Fletcher has done here, considering the circumstances. I mean, two out of the three off seasons that he's been here, he's gotten quite a lot done. And he's done it quickly, and he's done it despite uh, kind of fans um, sarcastically before the offseason would start saying, oh, Chuck Fletcher, he's not going to do anything again. I mean, look at what he did this offseason. Like it or not, I mean, he he traded Nolan Patrick and Phil Myers, who I didn't think had much value, and he got uh, Ryan Ellis, who's been injured. But when he's not injured, he's probably a top pair defenseman. Then he, he traded away a first round pick for rest, rest of the line and he needed to add another right handed defenseman to play on the second pair. And he did that. I didn't love the trade. I think rest of the line has been pretty good this season. And he's, he's shown to me that he, he will take action. His dad was a really good GM. Um, and, and I, I'm willing to kind of like say that Chuck Fletcher's first stint in Minnesota. I mean, people learn from, from past mistakes. And, and to me, he has taken action when action is needed to be taken. I think a lot of us felt that maybe this Flyers team, uh, if you added a top pair right defenseman and maybe a second pairing guy and maybe added a little bit of offensive depth and a good backup goalie, that maybe this team could compete this year. And Chuck Fletcher went out and he did all of that. Like It's it's not his fault that Ellis has been injured and that Kevin Hayes, um, w- who plays the one position where they kind of ran out of resources to add anyone in the off season. Like we all knew that third line center could be a problem. You know, they added Atkinson, they added Ellis, um, they added Ristolainen, but they just didn't have enough, uh, you know, um, gunpowder to add another center. And then all of a sudden Kevin Hayes is out for, for a lot of the season. So, you know, I don't think those injuries are, are Fletcher's fault. And, and to me, Fletcher has shown that he will take action. And so, 
I'm interested to see how the rest of the season plays out. I think that there is pressure probably on Fletcher from management to keep this team competitive, which would hamper his ability to orchestrate a complete rebuild. But I, I haven't lost the my faith that Fletcher could be a guy to do it if they say, hey, we need to re- rebuild. I figure, I, I feel like he could figure out a way to kind of navigate that. Okay. No, and that's a fair point. He's an Ivy League educated guy. And, and he did seem to uh, acknowledge that he made mistakes in Minnesota. And like he said, he learned from that. It, it's more than possible. And, and Chef, I think that that is something we have to consider as well. And this is why I was asking about Dave Scott, because I think he ultimately could be the biggest obstacle to a scenario where Fletcher would want to rebuild because they lost so much revenue during the COVID period. They're not really as overly concerned about the fan base. Uh, They're really more concerned about getting people in the building and and with the different expansion they did. And and I think it's kind of not really geared toward the best experience with regard to hockey. It's almost like, (laughs) you know, it's like if you don't like the game, go into the, this other area of the building and go to see our restaurants and clubs and stuff like that. But the bottom line is that costs a lot of money, that expansion, and they should, you know, they're going to want to get people in, in this place and they want to do it now for revenue recovery. And that that's really the big concern I have. Well, well, yeah, I mean, their backup plan is all the distractions that are down at the arena. That's their thing. If you get bored with the game or, you know, you're not liking the product, hopefully you'll spend money in other places. They, you know, I mean, for Christ's sake, it, it costs you how much money for a beer and a pretzel anymore or whatever it is down there. It's inflated. So that's where their real money, that's their, their main concern. In, in my opinion, that's what it feels like. It feels like that this ownership is displaced from its fan base. Or and, and and let's face it, for the years, oh, and years and years and years, no matter where you were in the hockey community, you you knew that it was not good coming into Philadelphia to play them. The fans would be was 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 another forward that was going to beat you down because they were so vocal, they were so loud, they were so everything, and that's just the, and and that's true to almost all Philadelphia sports. So to see the worry, the worry of mine is that. Yet needs a rebuild, and even if even if I say yes, Chuck is the guy to do it. I don't know how much Chuck is going to be handcuffed because look at how much he. To Dan's point, we talked about it, and I said it on a show with Jason, like that's like I said, oh, they need all these things, and you know how much is that? And it was like we were making jokes about how ridiculous the amount of change this team needed, but then he went ahead and did it. So I don't know if that was the that was our retool. So, I mean, you could make the argument that the retool wasn't enough now and that you do need the breakdown, but I still feel that two things that I don't think he's, you know, Scott is going to let them do anything to that extent. And two, I really do believe that this, we've said it many times in this season so far, this roster is not going to look the same come trade deadline, whether it's a wholesale fire sale or, Oh my God, we're close enough. Let's go for it. I, I really, I really don't know what it's going to be at this point. I had hope at the beginning, the first, you know, ten games of the season. Now, I'm confused. Uh, like this team is, uh, I, they have no identity. They, they have no drive. And hopefully, this two game stint now with the games coming up can turn into a six game stint. And and I guess you just uh, here 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 it is. Take them game by game. That's the you know. That's the only thing I could say right now. Yeah, I, I Dean, two things come to mind. You know, during this 10-game streak, it, it seemed crystal clear. The Flyers were, seemed unwilling or unable to get near the net. You would look at these heat maps, and the Flyers were playing what, you know, we joked was hackstall hockey. There were Most of their shots were like in a Tampa game, were like uh, 30 feet high above the slot. I mean, it's just really low percentage. And like, what is that? And then in the last couple of games, playing against a couple of goaltenders that didn't have great nights and maybe recovering confidence because, you know, hockey is a, a game of confidence. They did get around the net and they did jam and they did get the rebounds and the power play looked better. 
it's like how why do they go through these funks and how much do you think yo and changing the coaches had to do with getting them oriented toward playing a a more aggressive offensive game well i think you hit it on the ball there like it was all the coaching i i think because like we've seen in the past whenever they don't like a coach or if they don't want to be coached by that person they just look lost and they just I guess give up it because they scored what like 34 goals in like a 19 game span and I mean yeah. you look at their roster and it's on paper it's a pretty good team and I mean yeah you had a few in injuries to Hayes and Ellis and now Farabee but like they have a good enough team to score a lot more goals and then everybody went on this ridiculous scoring drought like JVR had no goals in like a, I think 11 games Coots had two goals in like 12 games um Konechny, same thing like nobody was scoring nobody wanted to get into the areas to get those goals and I feel like AV probably was like yelling at them and telling them like what to do but they just for whatever reason just did not want to listen and now that they have a like new coach there's a there's a new spark that happens every single time I don't know how long that will last because I mean we've seen it before with like a new coach where they get sparked for like maybe a week two weeks a, a month but, uh, I mean, I guess we'll see what happens when everybody comes back healthy because Allison should be back soon. I think Fairby should be back soon. Um, I'm not sure about Ellis. But, I mean, now it's just it's, it's gut check time because if they really want to make the playoffs, they have to go on another crazy run. Um, and like you mentioned, they have four to five easy games upcoming to build up that confidence. And we've seen them play a lot better the last two, two games. I mean, Vegas' defense was pretty good, though. Um, and they got stifled, and that was just a bad game. I mean, Hart played his heart out, and uh, Arizona game was just back and forth, and that was just two bad teams playing against each other. So I'm not too sure what what this season is going to look like. Um, and I, I don't want to sound pessimistic either, but we've seen like two decades of like Flyers hockey where they were at the top, and then they were at the bottom, then they came back up, and then they 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 like went back down. So. I guess we'll just take it game by game, like Chef said, and hope for the best. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, currently right now, Dan, uh, Sean Couturier is trending for 51 points, and this is like a projection over 82 games. We know these things are going to change, but it just gives you an idea where where they're at and how they've been playing. JBR, 28 points. Oscar Lindblom, 7 points. And then you think about that's bound to change. And then you think about them getting healthier. I mean, Ryan Ellis is supposed to get an MRI tomorrow. That should tell us a lot more about, you know, where that's headed. But if they get a little healthier, even though it's not super high-end talent, they still have a lot of depth on those forward lines, particularly if they trust Morgan Frost enough uh, to be center uh, and make that fourth line a little bit more of a threat. I mean, we know this team has talent, right? I mean, we all kind of felt that they were a borderline playoff team going into the season. And Farabee looks like he might be coming back soon. I mean, there are a lot of injuries. It looks like hopefully Farabee will be back soon. The guy, one guy you mentioned who I think everyone was kind of hoping was going to make a big difference and got injured in in the uh, preseason is Wade Allison. I mean, he he's a guy who is like – unanimously loved among Flyers fans because he plays like Scott Hartnell. He, he gets out there, he plays his heart out. He's got a really good shot. He plays physical. He just can't stay healthy, but he returned to the Phantoms this past weekend. And by all accounts, he was phenomenal. So he's a guy that I bet is going to be up soon. Yeah. Th- this team, you know, they, they f- should be an above 500 team from here on out. If they can get some guys back. I mean, I, we still, know that Kevin Hayes is probably not going to be a hundred percent maybe the entire season. So that's a problem, but yeah, Morgan Frost has looked a lot better too. I thought he played his best uh, game from a defensive standpoint uh, yep. against Arizona. And obviously Arizona doesn't have a lot of killers on their team, but, but Frost made a lot of really good defensive plays and he's, his confidence is gaining and it's going to be a slow burn for Morgan Frost. He has so much offensive talent and I think he's going to bit by bit start unlocking that talent more and more. And I think we'll start seeing some good stuff out of him. Ellis is the biggest problem for me. You know, is he going to come back healthy? I don't know. I've said that before that, that and I said it before he got injured, that if, if Ellis is out for a long period of time, that, that this team could go spiraling out of control because the defense is, is kind of a disaster. 
But uh, yeah, no, this this team has a lot of talent, and these guys come back and can stay healthy. They're going to be a, a hopefully a fun team to watch, and they'll and they'll win some games. But uh, again, it kind of goes counter to what we were talking about before. Well, it's going to you know fool management into thinking you know, hey, now we have got a shot at the playoffs, and then we're just going to be back in that same old spot. But from a a fan watching a game standpoint, I think I think there'll be some entertaining games coming up. Yeah, I don't think there's any question. The Flyers are a tease. I mean, you, you can just kind of in the moment. It's like being in a, a, a bad relationship. You know, you, you like each other. You know, you're not right for each other. And you're never going to get married, but you just kind of you're comfortable and you just kind of stick with it. And if they start winning some games, then you kind of fool yourself that, well, you know, listen, uh, this guy's pretty good. That guy's pretty good. It's not it's not going to go ultimately where we want it to go. And as someone who's a longtime fan and I, I just, you know, you, you get to that mindset where Ed Snyder was always about. Now I understand Mr. Snyder, may he rest in peace is gone, but this franchise has always been oriented toward going big time, try to win a cup, you know, and if the ceiling is not there and we see it's not there, then it's like, Oh, well, you know, then we're like any other franchise and, Oh, I hope we make the playoffs. And, and, and that's, you know, listening to the hot stove this, this weekend and interviewing uh, Mike, yo, uh, Anthony DeMarco was saying that's the, that was the, like the big message from on high, we've got to make the playoffs. We've got to make the playoffs. And to me, that's, kind of like what the Atlanta Flames used to say back in the day, or, you know, that Nashville would say back, you know, when David uh, Poyle took over, you know, after five years, okay, now we got to make the playoffs. It's got to be more than that. Because if it's not just reshuffle the deck. So that's, you know, that's the phenomenon you're dealing with the uh, chef. Well, to, to Dan's credit too, like, I, I gave him props. Morgan Frost did have a believed in all along was there. So that's a good thing. Uh, Hayes has been better than I thought he was going to be based off of a core injury. So I'll just say that. So that's a kind of pleasant surprise. And Allison, I watched like a couple of those phantom games they were on this past weekend. We was able to see them. Uh, so Allison, I mean, I wouldn't say he was like on fire, I say he looked like a guy that missed a couple of games, especially the first game. It looked like he was a little bit rusty, but you know, the second game he had a little more oomph in his in his. his maybe it was uh, maybe he was worried about gingerly on that ankle, but uh, second two games in a row, two days in a row. Uh, I, that's good that he held up like he did. So I'm happy for that. I think we could see him probably in a, a week or two, so that, which would be great. I understand that we're getting reinforcements coming, and I that's how I open the show with when you came to me, but I still think that there's going to be a chance for them to do a little bit more. And I think we're going to have to experience a little bit of the growing pains and probably saying goodbye to a couple of uh, player favorites. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it, it could be, I mean, it, a lot of the changes though, when you think about it, you have three guys off the street or off the waivers, right? Or is it four now? They yeah. had, I mean, before they signed Yandel, who at, who at times looks like has like he's been through. So he's very partner dependent. We know Provy is very partner dependent, and Sandheim and Ristolina have have been their most consistent pair. But then let's go back to the theme of the guys they picked up at the last minute. Broussard, he's hurt. I think he's got a hip problem. Um, at Patrick Brown, Zach McEwen, and they just added Kevin Connaughton, who's at least a professional defenseman and a definite upgrade on Nick Sealer. But, you know, that's a lot of spots in the lineup. And again, the, the injuries play a role, Dean, but it, it just speaks to, like, if a couple things go wrong or if, if a couple guys are hurt, you're leaning a lot more on those kind of players, and that can get you into trouble. Oh, yeah, and and like you said, like I think they're really just trying to make the playoffs and then go from and then go from there. But we but we saw in 2016 and 2018 that like cool you can make the playoffs, but if you don't have a good enough team or a good enough system, you're just going to get blown out, and then you're just going to be stuck with a middle like what like 18 19th pick in the in the draft, and then you're just not going to grab that player that you truly need, and then you're just going to keep doing it over and over and over. And then you're just going to keep 
you know, having the same issues. And uh, I mean, it pains me to like think that this could be Claude Giroux's last like season. Um, but I just don't see this team going anywhere with the roster that they currently have. And uh, I'm at a loss as to what they can do. Um, but, you know, I think it all just goes back to like what Hextel tried and then it goes back to what Homer did. And it's just an ongoing issue that we've dealt with for well over a decade. Yeah, it, it's really hard to argue with that. Just a couple numbers for people. Um, one good, one bad. Uh, let's start with the good. Uh, Carter Hart, despite slumping a little bit because what – what was around him was falling apart is still holding his own with uh, I think he's ranked 15th in the league in goal saved uh, against expectation. So he's literally saved uh, 5.1 more goals against than you would expect, which un- under these circumstances to maintain that after the number of games they've had is actually pretty good, but they still according to money puck only have a 7.2% chance of making the playoffs. So you know what I want to do now? I want to go back, Dean, I want to go back to you. I want to go back to June 23rd, 2011, because if you want the Genesis of what brought us here, you wrote a really good piece. There's some things in there. I agree with maybe some stuff I don't agree with, but I think we all can agree, even if Chris Pronger had stayed healthy, the Flyers had two 35 plus year old defensemen and they felt like they had to get a goalie. They were this close to a cup and they changed everything around and it really hasn't worked out. Maybe you could expand on what you wrote about. Well, yeah. Cause um, I mean, I was pretty young when that trade happened and Richards was my, was, and still is like my favorite player, but um, it just, the trade just didn't make sense because they were, I mean, not a successful team, but they had just come two games from winning the cup. And then, then the next year they won their division, but got blown out by Boston. Um, you, you did not have to make those two trades. If anything, you could have made one. Maybe you could have traded Carter because I think ever since Richards left, this team has not looked the same. And then you can make the argument that Homer, you know, retooled this team the best that he could because he grabbed Yager, he grabbed Talbot, he grabbed the goalie that he thought would like help, but then everything just imploded in his face the following year because then Yager left, Pronger left, uh, JVR got traded and he was supposed to be the like new franchise cornerstone and he traded him for Luke Shen who, I mean, albeit he wasn't a bad uh, player, but he wasn't what Homer was expecting because he thought he was some puck moving offensive player, but he was just a stay at home guy. And that trade made no sense. And then, um, you know, he backed Peter Laviolette um, by trading away Richards. And uh, then a few years after that, Laviolette's gone, then Hartnell's gone, then Tiemann's gone. And and then he went through this weird salary cap management where he just threw money out the window to anybody and everybody, like Roseman and Andrew Mc, McDonald. And I think it all just goes back to that Richards and Carter deal where he tried to stick a dynamite in this team and hope for the best, but it just, it just, it just pushed them back. Yeah. And there was some definite maturity and and some cultural issues. I mean, my position at that time, and Dan, I'm going to go to you next and chef. We'll we'll go from there. My thing was they needed defensemen, no matter what I, I wanted to bring in a guy who to compete with Bob, I wasn't ready to give up on him. I saw too much native talent but they had to have a defenseman. And I felt like Drew had elevated to the point where he could supplant Richards. You could maybe get Richards to get a defenseman and things might've been a little different, but obviously we know now that Carter and Richards both had, had issues. The thing about Richards for me was I didn't think for someone who had so much of his game was dependent upon his physicality. And he was known as a guy who didn't really like training a lot and, and he admitted later that he should have taken better care of his body. I thought that 12-year contract was not going to age very well. So that's, if there are no trade clauses for both of them were going to kick in. I thought, well, Carter takes care of himself. Richards doesn't. So that's what really concerned me. Dan, what, what was your thought, just looking back? Yeah, you know, I, I, think, I think that from what I understand and what I've heard that the trades kind of had to be made based on some off the ice stuff that, that happened. Um, 
And I think the Flyers did pretty well with the trades, but uh, you're right. It would have been nice if they would have gotten a defenseman out of it. I mean, they got a lot of really good forwards. They got Voracek, they got Wayne Simmons, they got um, Couturier. But yeah, I mean, the, the missing piece is, has been, you know, aside from the goalie position is a, is a defenseman. So, you know, I was, I was obviously very into the team back then. It was a little different, but that was sort of like the pre-Twitter era. And you're not, I don't know, not discussing it quite as much um, with, with a lot of different people. And I remember being shocked when, when Richards and Carter were, were moved. I think if you just look at what they got for those trades, right. I I think that it ended up being pretty good value, but, um, but yeah, the, the, it's, it's, it's weird that the franchise has kind of, has kind of lost their way. I mean, especially following the death of, uh, of Ed Snyder. So it's, yeah, I don't know. It's um, I feel like we need, we need an identity, you know, the, the, the fans and the team and the organization need an identity. I'm just not that optimistic that, that, that we're going to get one soon. And here's the thing, even with the rebuild, uh, there's no guarantee that you're going to be, even if you get up and get a, you know, top, four or five pick there's no guarantee the guy you draft is gonna is gonna make a big difference so you know ultimately maybe we're just supposed to win and you know enjoy the team that we've gotten and hope that they win but it's there's no easy answers with this one no not at all uh chef uh, what were your thoughts about that day and and where we're at right now as a result wow uh well, I was on the radio back then, right? Yeah, so we had nicknamed them the Party Boys. We had uh, because of all the stories that we were hearing, and uh, you know, it was, and we were, we felt bad when they went because we thought they had potential. And you know, Jeff went to Columbus, and Richards went to L.A., and then like what? Several months later, you know, Carter joined them out there, and we were like, "Yeah, the Party Boys are." are happy they're they're together again so that somewhere out we were making jokes somewhere some nightclub in california is really kicking right now you know so i mean that was our that was what we thought all joking aside yeah uh it was a decent it, we got a decent return on it and the problem but the problem was and from my opinion and looking at dean's articles too is there was never any supplemental support after that like after they got rid of like what couple of their big sources of goals uh they kind of and then with the free agent signings and stuff like that they they look good for a while but then they they of course they you know upper management alienated itself from their players yet again and that's a it's a common theme that keeps popping up in this organization unfortunately but the supporting cast like if you look at all the great teams like tampa bay is very good at it and the Patriots obviously are very good at it too. So, so looking at their secondary, they're getting the most out of their their second tier and third tier players. And I think that after that season, we really didn't have you know those third or fourth lines that could compete, generally speaking, around the league and provide. Especially after you tried away all those goals that got that missed out, you you, you didn't have enough to fill it back in. It's it's okay if you have four four or five 20 goal scores and you get rid of your 35 goal score, but that wasn't the case. You, you had to find offense from somewhere. And, and if you look back at those games, you see stagnants, like two game, two goal games, three goal games. And that's kind of like what we're seeing right now too, is at right now they can't seem to find, we know that they could score. JVR has a history of it. The other players have a history of it. And unfortunately some of them are just streaky. We have a lot of streaky players on this team. I've noticed that this, you know, Jones, JVR, uh, you know, I, I just, uh, yeah, yeah. And I just think that uh, all that, when they all, it's the perfect storm. All of them are, you know, quote unquote, pooping the bed at the same time now. So, and now well, I think it was just a perfect storm of, and that's the situation. You gotta, you gotta plan for situations like that though. But that's, that's at my time. I thought, I thought it was a good trade, but you know, what next what we we need to do a little bit more yeah i mean for me it's like the old scotty um bowman adage of you know don't just collect talent build a team and when they made those trades they collected talent and like dan was saying you know you had to get a defenseman uh or else that thing was going to fall off the cliff and and dean i mean that this is why they make the the jvr for shen trade i mean shen had shen was rushed 
right? He, he goes into Toronto and has a pretty good year. Very impressive. I mean, Tyler Myers had a good year. Same scenario. And then their play just goes downhill. And because they, you know, the league adjusts, adapts to them. And, and it's a, they learn their tendencies and weaknesses. And then they kind of, you know, tighten the reins on what they can do just so they don't make mistakes. And they get caught in that spiral. And they made a very, very bad trade. And and it was like then it kept trying to fill fill in the same pothole with, with lesser material. You know that the budget wasn't as high, and they kept backfilling. You know with lesser and lesser players until you know Hextall comes along and they try to do something different, which still hasn't worked out. Yeah, like that 2011 2012 team. I mean, that was a pretty fun team to to, to watch. They had a lot of good offensive players, and that. And that top line of Yager, Hartnell, and Sheru was great. And then they, I think they got good returns that season from Simmons, Voracek, and like Matt Reed. And then all of a sudden, again, during that off season, like everything just seemed to fall off. And I don't know what Homer was trying to do because, uh, you know, he never was able to replace any of those guys that they, that they lost. And then uh, Giroux was just stuck with uh, this mediocre talent. Cause I mean, again, like, as much as I loved Simmons and Shen, I don't think they were great five on five players. And again, I was pretty young when I was watching them, but it's just five on five, they could never do anything. So on the power play, they were great, but five on five, they weren't. And that was kind of their issue for like years. And then Hextall comes in and he, I don't know if he wanted to do a full rebuild or if he wanted to just do like a halfway, but no, he, he wanted to read. He, he didn't think you could, you, you had to tear it down. I mean, he yeah. definitely, he was clear. You, you, you can win and build and, and like kind of retool. I mean, that, yeah. that was, and that they, was everybody's big complaint. Yeah. And those two seasons that they made the playoffs under Hextall, I mean, it was Giroud played out of his mind. Uh, Ghost had a great year that like one season, same for Jake and Simmons and all those guys. But then once they made the playoffs, it was just so easy for the defense to zero in on the top line because the Flyers had nothing um, be like behind them. And uh, that was always the issue. And I mean, they I mean, credit to Fletcher. I mean, again, I wrote a lot of articles in the summer about how happy I was about these moves because they did look good. Um, and like Dan said, like just injuries came at the worst possible time. But um, I think this is probably the deepest team we've had in so long. And uh, we aren't playing well. I mean, just to go back to the start of the season, we had like two good games and then the wheels kind of just fell off. We were banking on great goaltending from Hart and Jones. We had good penalty killing, but just keeping us in the games. And then you could just tell that, they, you know, it was just a matter of time before the Flyers started to, to lose. And then they went on that 10-game bender. Yeah, but the process, the underlying process, as we hear so much from the uh, the analytics people, wasn't there. And it was predictable that they were going to slide. To this extent, I don't, you know, I don't think anybody <laughs> quite saw that. But so bringing us to the present day of, of where uh, they're at, you know, Dan, if they did want to make changes, like Charlie O'Connor wrote in his latest piece, they're not going to come for a couple months regardless. And and it's like, let's try and settle in with this season and, and see what they have as we come closer to the trade deadline. And then we can look in about four to six weeks from now, and then we'll have a better idea of, of what's realistic. Yeah, it would be nice to, uh, to, to get a lot of these guys back and kind of get a stretch where we can see – I just, I really want to see a stretch and it's probably not going to happen for a little while because it doesn't sound like he's all that close, but I, I really want to see a stretch with Provorov and Ellis on the, on the top pair, because as we've seen, Provorov's play gets a lot better when he's got a guy like a Niskanen or an Ellis who he can kind of rely on to be the steady rock with, with him. So that's what I really want to see is I want to see Ellis back and healthy with Provorov and I want to see Allison up. Uh, you know, hopefully Faraby is, is back and not that all, all that long. I, I want to see Hayes kind of uh, showing a little bit more of what he's got. And it will be nice to, to settle in and, and see what, what this team can show with, with those guys healthy, you know. But again, it's, it's hard to look at it without just saying to yourself, here we go again, you know, we're going to get close to the playoffs. And it's that, I don't know, who does the chart on – Twitter of like the, the fan base with the maximum pain threshold, which is the team that you know you're going to be sort of right on the playoffs. 
uh, every year. And it's always the Flyers. The Flyers fans are always right in that pain threshold. And it just feels like that's where we're headed again right now. So it's, I don't know how we, we break the loop, but, uh, but in the meantime, I think, right. There are some things to look forward to here in the coming days. Like the power play has been a lot more fun to watch. Yeah. Uh, and it, it sounds like, I think is it Daryl Williams that's heading up the power play right now. One of the assistant coaches. Right. Yeah. And what he's talked about is more movement, right. That they, they were kind of flat footed with Michelle Terry. And now it's like, okay, more movement, more guys moving around. I don't necessarily love the configurations all that much, but the power play looks a lot better because they're moving, they're passing. So that's kind of been nice to see. So there are things that are happening that make the games more enjoyable to watch. And I, I think maybe Mike Yo will break some of the dump and chase that was so you know prolific during the Elaine Vino era. That could that could be a nice little change to make the games better to watch. So yeah, obviously they lost ten in a row. Things are going to get better. Right. Um, and we'll just see where it goes. Yeah. I, I think the dump and chase was, uh, you know, it's a product of like, you have to have really aggressive, uh, fleet footed, uh, four checkers to play this like two, one, two. And I know Jason Martinez speaks a lot about it and, you know, you want as many controlled entries as you can get that the flyers don't have a lot of players that, that qualify in that regard. That was one of the positive aspects of, of Jake Borchek. So, but, you know, he had an expiration date here. There's no doubt about that. So as we look ahead and we see that the, they're going to play the Devils at home on Tuesday. They, they travel to Montreal. That's a strange schedule. They travel to Montreal on Thursday. And then on Saturday, they're back up in Canada. Uh, they're back in uh, at the uh, Wells Fargo Center to play uh, Ottawa. Uh, Saturday night. So th- these three games will give us a little bit more of a hint. And I think in that interim, we'll hear uh, probably the biggest medical news chef, and that's Ryan Ellis. I mean, maybe we'll get some determination whether he needs uh, some kind of surgery. Um, Dean, maybe you know something different that we do. We suspect we're talking about some kind of core muscle problem, hip problem, something in that range. Have you heard anything else? or No. Uh, like, was always a mysterious injury that nobody ever talked about and then like a month later you like like you said it turned out to be some core problem um but yeah like losing him was kind of like the like the domino and it's weird because he only played what three games before he got hurt the first time yeah yeah and then all of a sudden we looked terrible without him and it just never made sense and but then you know Provorov is so partner dependent so his play drops and then you have to you have to rely on uh, Sandheim and like and Ristolainen so much more and Sealer he had like one good game against Seattle and everybody was just like ooh and ah but like after that him and Yandel were just brutal like I saw some stat that like I think they Yandel and Sealer were on the ice for like more than half of the five on five goals compared to the to the rest. So Yeah, yeah. Maybe that goes back to like coaching, but then again, they don't have another defenseman to plug in because I'm sure if they did, they would have taken Sealer out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, everybody's I, I, slotted. Yeah. It, 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 this yeah. this defense is slotted to be the way your top pair, your second pair, your third pair. Now you got like guys out of place they're playing in the wrong spot so it's messing up it's not messing up see the problem is if somebody goes down and you got and it's your second or third pair usually you can just sub in somebody but when it's your top pair now it affects all the other pairs too you see because like somebody has to come up and you're not gonna you know on, on you know you wouldn't think that a third pair guy would be on the first one but Braun to his credit has been very you know, serviceable. He's 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 played above and beyond, but you can't expect that from him. Uh, it that's not as where he, you know it's not where this this team wanted him to be. Uh, so th- that's been my, my 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 major argument about that is they they're gonna eventually when Ellis hopefully does come back sooner or or if, or if they disclose what it is, you might have to go. Uh, outside the organization because after the last two games uh, I watched with the Phantoms as well, I was looking at Zamula and I was looking at York and I don't feel either one of them are ready to come up yet either. So it's not even close. And you got people clamoring, bring them up, bring them up. So what? So, so we can ruin them 
I mean, we're gonna we're gonna you know you, you can't open that that jar before the the, the date. You know, it, it's it's one of those bad things. So, but uh, I thought was Ellis? Did we? Was it a groin? Didn't he? I thought it might have been a groin issue from what I I, I read somewhere. Well, that's yeah, that's, yeah, that's that all in the yeah. same area. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, Dan, you, you were saying... Uh, no, I, just, I don't think I've seen any kind of official... Yeah, no, I haven't. We're guessing at that. Um, but, I mean, that that's really it. I mean, for me, well, what's going to happen... And, Dan, I, I will go to you, because th- if we find out something about Ellis, right? And he's making, what, $6.25 million. I don't have Cat Friendly right in front of me right now. But, and it, will they go out and try to make a move to replace him if he needs surgery, even if they think he'll be out until the playoffs or something like that. And that'll tell you a lot, the kind of player they go after, or if they don't go after, or they're not able to acquire somebody, even with cap relief, where their thinking is perhaps, and uh, perhaps not. I don't know. What do you say? I, yeah. Let, let's say they say, come out and say, Hey, you know what? Ellis needs surgery and uh, he's going to be out the rest of the season. It, you know, you're not going to be able to get a t- in the middle of the season. You're not going to be able to get a top pairing right-handed defenseman. It's just not going to happen. So, at that point, I, I don't know. Again, at that point, I would just hope that they would uh, try and accelerate a rebuild type of, of of process and you know look to move a guy like Giroux. I just unless maybe one of you guys has a smarter di- idea than I do, but if if they lose Ellis, I, I don't think. I don't think you're you're getting that guy to play on that top pair this season. Yeah, but yeah, would they go out and get um would they expend resources to get a guy like Sherratt from Montreal, Dean? I mean, I, I mean they, that you know, they would want at least a top prospect. We're in no position to go give up a first round draft pick for a guy like Sherratt, who I don't even really I think he's more of a like a two three kind of guy at best. I mean, he looked really good playing with the Shea Weber. Who who wouldn't, you know? Yeah. Well, again, I guess it it just all comes back down to whether or not they want to retool or rebuild. Because if you're gonna, if Dave Scott and like Fletcher and like Homer, if they really want to go for it, they're gonna make a, they're they're gonna try to make a a trade for anybody, and it and it, and it's gonna backfire because it's not gonna help. And um, then, it, then they're just going to expend resources that we're going to need for the for the future. And like Dan said, there's not that many guys out there that you can go for. So then the premium for those, you know, those middle tier D's are going to be even like higher. And then we're going to have to spend like our first round pick plus plus. So if Alice does go down, then I think you just see what this team can do up until the trade deadline. And if you're still floundering, then you. I guess accelerate the rebuild to some degree. If you're within the playoffs, I guess just stand pat because I wouldn't make any trade right now. Yeah, I think they would try to like um, at least kind of get a band aid defenseman in here. Yeah. I mean, Kevin Connaughton's like a band aid for the third pair, but he's not. You know, they'd have to get someone at least a top four. Or so mm-hmm. let's see what the Flyers do over the last three games and uh, get some social media coordinates. Dean, let me start with you. Uh, People can follow you at Flyers Nation. Where can people find you on Twitter and other social media outlets? Um, I believe my Twitter handle is Dean Chaudhry 94. And that's that's usually where I post most of my articles once they get posted on Flyers Nation. But uh, other than that, I don't really use much of the other socials. Cool, cool. Well, you've been very prolific, and people have to go to uh, flyersnation.com to check it out. I, I you know, I want to say thank you very much uh, for coming on the show because uh, you got to check this guy out. These are great articles, and uh, it's really great stuff. No, I like thank you for giving me the the opportunity because I've only been doing this for like a for a for a few months, so it's uh. It's a great platform, and uh, again, thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, it's been our pleasure. You you sound like well, you've been following the team for it's about twenty years now. Yeah, I was. My mom got me into it when I was about five, so I remember a little bit of like the ninety nine two thousand Eastern Conference Final. My most vivid early <laughs> memory was when uh, Flyers beat Toronto because um because I was from t- Toronto. Um, 
And then again, from there, it was just the Richards uh, timeline where I was just a huge fan. And then ever since then, it's just grown more and more. And sadly, it's kind of tough being a Flyers fan for the last <laughs> decade. No, I, I hear you. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, we got I got a couple of years on you. <laughs> so uh, and we all do. But me, me especially, I'm, I'm the old guy here. Uh, so, uh, yeah, again, thanks uh, for, for coming by and uh, hope to hear from you again very soon. Thanks. All right. You take care now. Yeah. See you guys. All right. Bye bye. Later, Dean. See you. Later. OK, so, yeah, I just want to give us um the uh, opportunity to uh, just go through a couple of sundry things before we uh, re- resume. Just a reminder, everybody, that the OMB podcast and flyersandnittygritty.com are brought to you by uh, Jim South Street, 400 South Street in Philadelphia, PA, 40 years of the best cheesesteaks in the finest Philadelphia tradition. With or without, it doesn't matter. And if you live down near 400 South Street, but you can't make it over, no problem. They use DoorDash, and they'll get that delicious food right to your door. So remember, next time you want cheesesteak, hoagie, fries, the best of Philadelphia, remember Jim South Street, 400 South Street in Philadelphia, PA. And uh, Dan, I want to get, get with you before we roll, because you had something else you wanted to mention that you were talking about in the beginning. And uh, it does slip my mind, but I remembered that you said something that you wanted to to cover. Yeah, I just think that, you know, for those of our listeners who are on Twitter, you know, over the course of the last week, this movement has kind of happened to where, and I don't even know where it started, but that Flyers fans on Twitter uh, in droves are changing their profile photo to a photo of of either a Flyers fan with a with a brown bag over his head uh, one of it's one specific photo that a lot of people are using, or people are just photoshopping their own photos and putting a bag over their head. Oh, right, right, right. With with, with an with a, a unsmiley face. And for me, it's like one of the most fascinating things that's happened on Twitter because you know, Flyers fans on Twitter just argue with each other about everything. There's you know the the. There's the prospect idiots who I was, you know, probably people would say that about me a few years ago. And oh, everyone, every, every prospect's going to be great. And then there's, you know, the, the everyone, all the negative people. And then there's all the Hextall lovers. And people just love screaming about each other. And it's screaming at each other. And it's sometimes it's not even, you know, hockey or Flyers related. People are opining on politics or whatever. And every everyone is just arguing each other to the point where, like, you know, I've gotten really nasty DMs from various people over the years, wow. you know, physical threats, like all kinds of crazy shit. And I'm like, this is a social media platform. Anyway, you know, the Flyers lose 10 straight and uh, someone starts this trend. And now I'd say 90 to 95 percent of the Flyers fans that I see on Twitter have this photo of, of a, a fan with a bag over their head. And it's like for me, it's been really difficult to to talk about this team or cheer for this team. Uh, And then you go on Twitter and everyone's so negative. And this is actually like, to me, I've seen a lot of Flyers fans come together over this. Like, Hey, we're all in the same boat together. We're, we're putting these Brown bags over our head. We're sending a message to the organization. I've kind of mixed thoughts about it because I also think that the Flyers players clearly are looking at paying attention to Twitter. I mean, Jake Voracek had everyone blocked. Scott Lawton has a lot of people blocked. Nate Thompson earlier this year went after Alex Appleyard from the athletic for something he posted on Twitter. Yeah. yeah, So these guys are clearly paying attention. Right. And if I'm a a professional athlete, if I'm a flyers player and I see that all the fans are doing this Brown bag movement, that's going to cause resentment like between, between me and the fans. So from that perspective, I don't love it, but seeing what the fan community on Twitter kind of come together on this and not argue. And it's actually made it a little bit more enjoyable to, to watch the games while looking at Twitter because everyone is talking about it. And even the flyers official Twitter account uh, after they broke their losing streak in Vegas, uh, the flyers account tweeted out, um, you know, something like two points for the flyers. You can, put it in the bag or something like that. Right, right, right. And I was like, yeah. So they're actually, the, the Flyers Twitter account actually looked at it. Maybe someone in social media lost their job over that tweet. But I thought that was, you know, pretty funny. So for me, it's one of the more fascinating things that I've seen come along on Flyers Twitter. No, no, it's, I'm glad you brought it up because I, 
you know, I, I put a tweet out there and said, yeah, I get it. I see what you're doing. It's just not my bag. You know, a little play on words. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's somewhat cathartic and it's a bonding experience. It's um, it's commiseration. There's no doubt about it. The, the chef, uh, the first time I ever saw that was way back in the Archie Manning days of the New Orleans Saints where the fans were showing up in the stands with ba- uh, brown bags over their heads. That's <laughs> well, how far back, like, like the 70s. <clears throat> it goes back to the 70s, the gong show, doesn't it? Remember the it unknown might, comic? Yeah. The unknown well, comic. Yeah, his okay. jokes were yeah, so bad yeah, that yeah, he had yeah, to wear a brown time. bag over his head so they wouldn't throw tomatoes and beat him up afterwards. So, And that's and that's pretty much a rift on it. And I get it. And people, it, it's to me, it's funny. Uh, you know, if, if you... You go out there and, you, like Dan said, you need something to bond over. And if it's to quell the fighting or if it's to get a good laugh, you know, the brown bag over there, I saw it and I, st- I immediately laughed. And I said, you know what, this is kind of funny. And I'll see how, how, this, how this takes off. And it took off like crazy. I couldn't believe it. So I was really happy about it. And to the, speak to the players, like, well, look, you know, if we have to suffer through your games of where you're not hustling, not going in, not playing hard, not dumping after the pucks, not not giving the fans the show. Not going to the, the net. They, They're nowhere near yeah, the going, net. Yeah, going to the net. If you're not going to give the fans a show, you can't be upset that, you know, that the fans are voicing their opinion. They're the ones paying for that product, you know. Yeah, even if you're not going to the games, you, you got to pay some kind of package to get your, your, your thing on the TV or whether it's, you know, the NHL package or if you get Fios or whatever, Comcast or whatever, it doesn't matter. You still you still have to pay for it. So, you know, when you're sitting there going, oh, gee, I wonder what's on the Real Housewives in New Jersey tonight. The Flyers are already losing four to one. Then you have a problem <laughs> and you yeah. deserve a bag over your head. No, I mean, there, there's so many games. I mean, a Calgary game. Earlier in the year, we thought it was just a blip in the radar screen, but it was just a preview to what happened when they just waxed by Tampa Bay seven to one, and and, and Carter Hart just whiffs on that on that uh, clearing play, and then he looks like he's almost ha- about to have a moment like he had last year in Boston. Remember when he flipped out yeah. and broke his stick? I'm thinking, oh my God, this is taking me back to Boston last year. I hope he does, you know, he doesn't start flipping out and he's recovered nicely. So that at least there's something good there. So, well, with that, look, like I said, uh, Jersey at home in Montreal, back at home versus Ottawa, and then we'll be back and uh, we're going to have a special show planned for next week. We'll, as we get more details, we'll let you know about that. Okay. So Dan, uh, final statement and social media coordinates. Yeah, you can find me at uh, at dsilver88, and you know, just it's the holiday season. I hope everyone has a, has a good holidays. Uh, we'll be back next week. I'm going to be actually at the Flyers game on Tuesday, uh, Flyers Caps game. I bought myself one ticket before the season started, right next to the Flyers bench. I was like, you know what? I'm going to get myself a little early Christmas present. So there you I go. bought one one ticket. It's the Ivan Provorov nesting doll giveaway, so I'm kind of looking forward to that. Uh-huh. Hopefully, I can just go and you know enjoy a Flyers game. And, but uh, but maybe they'll have a five game winning streak going into that. Who knows? Yeah, hopefully the doll won't freeze up. Uh, uh, Chef. Well, you can find me at Chef to Left B on Twitter. And uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, if they want to show any kind of positivity, positivity, I think they need to get five out of six possible points these next three games. I think anything less than that should be considered a failure. Well, yeah, they they need as many points as they can get right now. They're not actually that far out of a yeah. playoff spot, uh, six points. And, and, and some teams they have, uh, in fact, with Pittsburgh, they have one game in hand and they are, yeah, but they're, they're, they're way out. They're way by, they're nine points behind Pittsburgh, but uh, yeah, Boston, Boston has their own troubles without David Krejci. They've had a tough transition. So yeah, be worth uh, taking a look at. So until next time, everybody, uh, thanks for listening tonight and take care.